we're back. Hello. Welcome back. Part four. The Ecumenical Councils. We had a pretty good Christmas break around here at the Fowler household. I hope y'all had a very good Christmas break. I know the paleocrat did. He's been typing his brains out, working on that book. Um, should be coming out. Uh, well, coming out, I don't know. Going to print soon, right? I know he's, he's turning it in soon. It's all going to be very good. It's going to be very interesting. A glimpse inside the banister mind. Uh, yeah, I don't know how else to put it. It's just going to be awesome. Uh, gosh, if you're tuning in, that means you must enjoy church history and theology almost as much as I do, which is good. We're trying to learn from the ecumenical councils. We've looked at Nicaea. We've looked at Constantinople I. I left you there before Christmas, before the new year, before Epiphany. And so here we are afterwards. We're going to pick it up around 381 AD. The second ecumenical council has concluded. What's next? Let me remove this rockin' music. Flip my screen over. Here we go. Okay. Obligatory sip of beer. Here we go. During this period, uh, which is roughly 50 years, almost exactly 50 years, between 381 and 431, which will be the Council of Ephesus, there was uh, a significant shift occurring throughout the Roman Empire, particularly in the West. In fact, almost solely in the West. You see, there were these Germanic tribes streaming in to the Roman frontier from the East and the North, driven mostly by the nomadic Huns. The Huns were, um, to put it kindly, maybe a rough sort of people, and they were driving the Germanic peoples south and west, and they settled in various spots on the continental Europe. Let me give you a picture of kind of where everybody was. The, there were a, a tribe called the Burgundians in Savoy, which is sort of France and Switzerland area, the Alemanni in the Upper Rhine, which is to say southwest Germany and maybe eastern France, the Franks, who will become extremely important as we move forward, in the Lower Rhine region, so Belgium, northern France, the Netherlands, the Visigoths, which is the, the western Goths, in southern Gaul, which is southern France, the Ostrogoths, the east Goths, in Pannonia, the Hungarian plain, and finally the Vandals, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. Vandals like vandalism, because again, these were folks who weren't really kind either, especially with people's things. They, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, so Portugal, Spain, and then even Northern Africa, they had a significant kingdom set up there in the early to mid 400s. Significantly, these same Vandals sacked Rome twice, once within the time period we're going to look at in 410 under their, their chief Alaric. Uh, and I believe it's then that the name vandalism sort of kind of stuck. All right. So that's one major shift that's occurring within the Western Roman Empire. Because of this, Roman law and Germanic custom are sort of starting to blend together. At least the beginnings of it are, are starting. This is forging what we would later come to recognize as Europe. So sort of out with the old, in with the new kind of thing. Um, I should mention, this was prophesied in Daniel. In, in the prophet Daniel, I believe it's in Daniel chapter 2, um, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. There's a statue. It's made of all different sorts of materials. None of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's wise men can decipher it. And Daniel is given the opportunity. He prays to the Lord God. God gives him the interpretation of the dream, which he tells to the king. Well, to make a long story short, this, uh, this statue represents various kingdoms that will come and go. And the final stage of the coming and going of kingdoms, I think a lot of scholars identify that with the barbarians and the Romans intermarrying, intermingling, their society sort of blending, and this coincides with the expansion of the church. Not exactly the proper timeline. You know, the church had been in existence for several hundred years, but 
you get the point. And I think it's a legitimate way to interpret that prophecy anyhow. So out with the old, in with the new. Well, what's the new? A changing political situation um, is obvious, right? Particularly um, given that the emperors in the West were more or less puppet emperors. They were there. They were official, right? But they had to really play nice with some of the barbarians in order to retain power. In 476, now this is the, the, the typical year that's given for the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and for good reason. It is in this year that one German in particular, Odo Vacar, deposes Romulus Augustus, or Romulus Augustulus, as he was called, like little Augustus kind of thing. And this is the first time, oh, excuse me, he, uh, this Odo Vacar, this German uh, warrior of some sort, proclaims himself king, king of Italy, king in, in the, the Roman area. This is the first time in almost a thousand years that a king has ruled in Italy and not a Caesar. And I'm aware that Caesar roughly translates king. You get the point. A non-Roman ruling Rome. Vast changes underway. On the ecclesiastical side, because of these cultural and social conditions, the bishops played somewhat different roles in the West than they did in the East. For instance, Western bishops had to become more like administrators of the city, and they often busied themselves with more worldly and mundane affairs. Think of uh, Ambrose of Milan. He was um, chosen to be bishop because he was such an able administrator. In fact, he was a Roman official prior to that. So as a result, the bishops in the West, uh, in general, typically had less time for the intricacies of theological speculation. Now, that's not to say that it never occurred. That's not to say that the Latin fathers or the Latin bishops at this time are illiterate by any means or lacked in understanding. That's not what I'm getting at. I'm simply pointing out that they were kind of busy and so that the majority of them did not go as deep as often as their Eastern counterparts. So as a corollary to this, relatively speaking, fewer errors popped up in the West. Eastern bishops, on the other hand, uh, although they, they weren't uninvolved in politics by any means, but they weren't really filling these dual roles of administering the church, administering the city or, or the province or what have you. And so there was more time for theological speculation, more time for scholarship. It was a great thing. I mean, I may not be around if it weren't for some of the people that have gone before doing theology, keeping it alive, right? And it's naturally going to deepen and elevate our understanding of the faith. And thanks be to God. But it's going to bring with it a certain amount of error. So that's sort of the downfall to having this extra free time. Because you're not busy administering a city or looking after the affairs of the empire in place of the inept Roman officials. A good example of the depth of theological expertise that was achieved, uh, and if we look at the two schools, one at Antioch and one at Alexandria, they were vo both um, widely renowned as being extremely so strong, solid schools of theology, but they had different focuses, and each had its strengths and its weaknesses. Let me begin with the Antiochene school. They were more focused on the literal exegesis of Scripture, that is to say the historical sense or the literal sense, and the distinctions that have to be made between divine things and human things. So you could think of it um, 
uh, sort of a, a handy way to remember would be to say analysis over synthesis. They want to break it down. They want to understand the parts. Okay. They want to study the, the letter of the scriptures instead of the spiritual meaning, which sort of ties it all together. They didn't ignore that part by any means, but it wasn't their main focus or their main emphasis. Contrarywise, in Alexandria, the Alexandrian school was more concerned with the spiritual senses of scripture, and they naturally, therefore, emphasized the unity or the togetherness of the truths of the faith compared to their counterparts in Antioch. And so we simply reverse the phrase I mentioned a moment ago, synthesis over analysis. So looking at the big picture, the whole, how things come together, and less of a focus on the constituent parts. Antioch and Alexandria, yes, in communion with one another, obviously part of the body of Christ, but there was a bitter rivalry that went on, right? Here's a good example of the sort of things that would have occurred. There was this man, John. He was from Antioch. His detractors were from Alexandria. John was proclaimed, appointed, I should say, the Patriarch of Constantinople. I'm referring to St. John Chrysostom. He preached the truth when he was in Constantinople. He didn't shy away from saying hard things and calling people out when they needed to be called out. And it kind of got him in a little trouble with some people, maybe like the imperial family. That is what happens when you compare the empress to Jezebel. Maybe not the best idea, John, but he spoke the truth always. He was bold, and so we should laud him for that. Well, like I mentioned, it got him in a little hot water. People were not very happy about this. The patriarch of Alexandria used that to charge John and successfully depose him. Um, he was driven out of Constantinople in the year 404. And although he was the patriarch of Constantinople, if you recall from just a moment ago, John was an Antiochian. Theophilus, the patriarch of Alexandria, when John was appointed, he didn't get his guy in. The emperor chose John instead, and so the feud sort of continued. You get the point. There's a rivalry between these schools. They, they have different emphases of theology, and when they have the opportunity, they kind of try to stick it to the other one. Okay? All right, let's shift back to the West for just a moment. There were two heresies that I want to mention in the West. Not that they weren't a big deal, but I'm saying it so that I can pass over it. We really want to focus on the councils, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention at least a couple of problems in the Western Church at this time. The first of which, Donatism. Donatism had been around for a while already. Uh, recall, we're, we're somewhere around the year 390, 400, and Donatism had been a thing since roughly the 250s, the Decian persecutions. The Donatists, you see, they insisted on a pure and holy church. They were the rigoristas that our Kaiser often refers to. They wanted a church that was free of sinners. And uh, sort of as a conclusion of this, or, or, or a logical following, they thought, well, the moral worthiness of our priests, of the ministers of the sacraments, must be a pretty big deal, and it would even render the sacraments valid or invalid, depending. So if a priest lapsed into sin, his ability to confer the sacraments or to say Mass was null in the mind of the Donatists, speaking generally. Their initial reason for breaking away, and they were schismatic, don't get me wrong, they broke away. They started their own hierarchy. They broke from Caecilian of Carthage because he was allegedly consecrated by a bishop who himself allegedly handed over scripture to the Roman authorities. So in their minds, he betrayed the faith. He lost his power to consecrate. I mentioned the moral worthiness of the ministers 
it affects the validity of the sacraments according to the Donatists. And so if this bishop handed over the scriptures, thereby committing a mortal sin, and then goes to consecrate Caecilian of Carthage, well, his consecration would be nothing, really. And so the Donatists said he was an illegitimate bishop and were breaking away. They were relatively small compared to other heresies. It was a problem, don't get me wrong. But again, it wasn't as widespread as some others. The second heresy I want to mention in the West was Pelagianism, so named after a British priest, Pelagius, who taught roughly that one could gain heaven of their own accord through free will. I'll do good works. God will reward me with heaven. I really don't need grace as long as I'm doing the right thing. It's really my effort that counts after all. Keeping the law, avoiding sin, all good. Pelagius was swiftly condemned by the church, and our very own Augustine spent much of his time refuting not only Pelagianism, but also the Donatists. Neither one of these, I mentioned, took very firm root, and although they were a problem, they didn't cause the sort of scandal that would have led to an ecumenical council. Unlike Nestorianism, Nestorius was the patriarch of Constantinople between 428 and 431. He later died in 452. Nestorius was a well-respected abbot. He himself was from Antioch, which angered the Alexandrians. Again, they didn't get their man into the position they wanted to get. Why is this position so important? Well, the Patriarch of Constantinople has the ear of the emperor, is very influential at court, and there's a lot of prestige that goes along with that, obviously. Nestorius brought to Constantinople with him his Antiochian emphasis on distinction and analysis as the fundal, fundamental framework that he used to explain the faith. His main struggle, or one of his main struggles, was how to explain the unity or the synthesis regarding the person of Christ. Now think of it. If your main jam is analysis and distinction and analyzing the constituent parts, then when it comes time to put these things back together, if you haven't had a clear idea of how to do that all along, you may run into some errors. The Christology of Nestorius runs roughly like this, that God the Word was conjoined to the man Jesus, and the result was the person of Christ, or the, the prosopon of union. Prosopon in Greek uh, can be used roughly for person. The union in him, capital H, him, of these natures was not a real union in essence, but one of grace or favor. So because of the grace bestowed upon the man Jesus, God the Word can be conjoined to him, and they can present as one prosopon, one person, whom we call Christ. Nestorius described each of the natures as being a hypostasis. If you recall, or if you want to go play back the tape, hypostasis was often used for person, but it could be used for nature as well. So when Nestorius describes the two natures as hypostases and the one person as a prosopon, sometimes you could understand that to mean two persons, two hypostases, right? He did argue, I want to be fair to Nestorius, heretic though he was, he argued that there was one person and that there was one concrete external object of perception. Nestorius denied that this division of two hypostases led to there being two persons. 
but on the same, uh, by the same token, he failed to explain how these two natures were united. And so the charges were brought against him, um, figuratively at first, that he was dividing the Son, two sons, two persons. There was Jesus, the Son, by grace or by favor, and there was the Word, who was the Son, by nature. And these two weren't the same, but they were united in this one prosopon. So it's a little bit muddle-headed, if you think of it. An answer comes from Alexandria. Cyril, Theophilus's nephew, assumes the patriarchal throne in 412. Now, that's 16 years prior to Nestorius coming to Constantinople. So Cyril is already somewhat a veteran being a bishop, a veteran of being a bishop, right? He's got the feel for it. 16 years on the job, you pretty well know what you're doing. Theophilus' battle with a certain Antiochian, John Chrysostom, who, he, uh, who was placed in Constantinople, remained in Cyril's mind. Again, the Alexandrians are not getting their way in the capital. They're not getting their guy into that slot. They've got a bad taste in their mouth because of that. And because he was an Alexandrian, Cyril embraced the emphasis on synthesis and unity over and above that of analysis and distinction. Again, not that he would have ignored that, but his fundamental worldview, or, or his theological worldview, as it were, would have been synthesis over analysis. Cyril says this about the person of Christ, that it's one and the same subject. God the Word, he's the one who took on flesh. It wasn't a conjunction. It wasn't as if Jesus the man and God the Word were conjoined into one person, but truly a union of natures at the level of person. Therefore, we can say, the Son of God suffered, or the Son of Mary worked miracles. Uh, and to take it even further, the Eucharist, whose body is that? It's God the Word. Cyril refused to say, in two natures, because he thought that might imply some division between them. And again, he wanted to maintain the unity the synthesis, the one subject, God the Word, who takes on human flesh, is united in this person, right? Cyril unwittingly embraced a phrase that was Apollinarian. If you recall, again, from our previous segments, Apollinaris, Bishop of Laodicea, uh, was a heretic. And there were some writings of his that were passed off under the name Athanasius. Cyril believed he was reading St. Athanasius, and he picks up this phrase, one incarnate nature of the divine word. Let me say that again. One incarnate nature of the divine word. Cyril thinks this comes from Athanasius. It actually comes from Apollinaris. A heretic. The battle is on. Cyril and Nestorius begin to exchange letters. They're not entirely nice letters. They're correcting each other. They're maybe a little snarky at times, especially Cyril. Word around is that he was a bit of a hothead. Cyril and Nestorius both also sent letters to Rome, to the Pope at the time, Celestine. Cyril obtained Celestine's agreement in the theological matter, and Celestine asked Cyril to act as his deputy, his legate, and to tackle the growing issue with the Nestorians. Nestorius sort of shot himself in the foot a little bit. He tarnished his own reputation. In one of his letters to the Pope, he inquires about the errors of a certain Julian of Eclanum, who was a Pelagian. Celestine would have been very familiar with the Pelagian heresy, 
And here's Nestorius saying, you know, Holy Father, I don't understand. What's the problem with these guys? I don't really see anything wrong with it. Can you explain this to me? So there must be like a, an alert going off in Celestine's head. This is a red flag. Do you mean to tell me that Nestorius doesn't see the problem with Pelagianism? And now he's running around saying that there are two sons? What is the problem with this guy? Pope Celestine weighs in. We've shot up through time a little bit. We're in about 430. In fact, we're in exactly 430 in August. Celestine holds a synod in Rome. This synod condemns Nestorius' position as untenable. And they demand that Nestorius recant and accept the apostolic faith. Celestine wrote to Cyril with a letter of instruction for how to deal with this, and he sent him on to Constantinople. Now, Cyril, for whatever reason, took it upon himself to append to the Pope's document 12 statements. Uh, these were known as, now known as, the 12 anathemas. I don't believe Celestine knew about this at first. I don't believe Celestine authorized this. I think Cyril took it upon himself, and I think the evidence supports what I'm saying, to add these things. Remember, any chance the Alexandrians can get to get revenge over the Antiochenes, they would take. Theophilus, Cyril's uncle, did it. Cyril is about to do it to Nestorius. I have to ask, Clearly, Cyril overstepped his authority here. Was the document still valid? Were the Pope's words to Nestorius somehow nullified because Cyril had added his own words to them? I would say no. Celestine's words stand. But Cyril's segment is dubious. Who authorized that? Who checked that? Cyril and his party delivered to Nestorius the ultimatum in December of the year 430. Nestorius balked at it, and he rallied the support of the Patriarch of Antioch, his buddy, no doubt, and the royal family. The emperor, who is now Theodosius II, has already stepped in and called for a council to convene in Ephesus the following year. Celestine, although... I, I don't believe he wanted a council. He did agree. And so the invitation was sent out to all the bishops of the world. Council in Ephesus 431. The plan from Nestorius and Theodosius, the emperor, was to put Cyril on trial for usurping the authority, for usurping authority, excuse me, from Celestine, and for his heterodox views, Apollinarianism. Cyril was believed by Nestorius and Theodosius and probably the Patriarch of Antioch to be an Apollinarian. Cyril's plan, on the other hand, was to depose Nestorius and to impose his view of orthodoxy on the church. Now, his view of orthodoxy was, in fact, correct. It had the support of of the Pope, it is scripturally sound, and it is the faith that we have received from the apostles. But you know, it's never that easy. Next time, next time, we will look at the Council of Ephesus 431. This is where the, the steam, the heat, the battles, they really start to kick off. Nicaea was one thing. Arius was a bad dude. Constantinople was another thing altogether. But my goodness, from Ephesus to Chalcedon to Constantinople II, three, Nicaea II, it's incredible. And I can't wait to share all this with you. I appreciate your attention, folks. I really do. Welcome back once more. I hope you had a Merry Christmas and a blessed epiphany. Please don't forget to head over to Paleocrat Diaries Wolfpack Chat. Join the Glad Trad Revolution. Don't be a mad trad or a bad trad, a rad trad or a sad trad. 
just be happy. We laugh. We, we mess with each other. We roast the Kaiser Jeremiah all the time. It's great. You should check it out. Don't forget to hit up his website, paleocratdiaries.com. Be sure to patronize the meaning of Catholics. Support Mr. Flanders and all the good work that he does. And last but not least, keep watching these videos. Maybe you'll learn something. All right. Until next time, never give up, keep on smiling, and memento morning.